Hello, I'm Carrie Hulak, Social Media Manager for Berkeley Earth, an independent nonprofit organization focused on environmental data science. Given what's going on with the West Coast fires and smoky air, I invited two Berkeley Earth scientists, lead scientist Robert Rohde and climate scientist Zeke Hausfather, to spend a few minutes putting this historic month of climate news into perspective. Welcome, Robert and Zeke. Thank you for joining me today. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's good to be here. Let's start with the wildfires, which have burned more than 5 million acres in Oregon, California, and Washington, and caused some of the worst air quality in the world. Did either of you ever imagine that such a scenario would be happening in 2020? I mean, I don't think anyone knew that 2020 was going to be the year that everything caught on fire. Uh, but we have known for a long time that climate change is creating conditions that, that will make wildfires larger uh, and more extreme. So we are, have been moving for quite a while in the direction for more events like this. Uh, you know, widespread burning and, it, and with it very widespread air pollution. Yeah, we've certainly seen a lot of very severe fires happening in the Western U.S. in the last few years. Um, you know, a typical year in the last five years has seen about $100 billion in damages from wildfire. Um, and obviously, we expect them to be considerably higher this year, given it's the historic nature of the burns. Uh, but anyone paying attention to the conditions in the Western forests and the rate of climate change in the region um, would suspect that something like what's happened this year is not outside the realm of possibility. Okay, thank you. So given this historic year, we're seeing a ton of discussions and debates erupting everywhere, um, you know, political, among the climate science community about the role of climate change versus the impact of how U.S. forests are managed. Uh, so I know you're both very involved in that, listening um, on Twitter and, and you know, speaking to the media yourselves. Um, tell us what the facts show so far. And, and I know you're probably busy researching this live as it, as it unfolds in the last few weeks. So tell us what you've kind of been able to conclude so far. So, you know, it's clear from uh, the scientific literature that there is a strong role for climate change in these wildfires. Um, we see that, you know, years that tend to have drier fuels um, tend to have much wider areas burned and the amount of dry fuel, the sort of fuel aridity as we call it, has increased dramatically in the Western US uh, in the last few decades in part due to the change in climate. Um, but at the same time, it really does a disservice to focus only on climate change. Um, we were sort of suffering from a, uh, the penalties of our own success over the last century in putting out fires in the Western US. Um, many Western US fires, or many Western US forests, that is, uh, are adapted to have frequent uh, low severity fires burn through them. In fact, some types of trees can only germinate after a fire sweeps through. Uh, and so when we put out all these fires that used to you know, naturally burn in the region, uh, we end up with a much larger buildup of uh, brush and other fuels. And so what that means is when fires do happen in those forests that we can't put out, uh, they tend to be much more severe. They tend to reach up into the tree canopies and actually kill the trees. Um, and so what we're really seeing in the Western US is a combination of uh, poor forest management and specifically poor uh, or over enthusiastic fire suppression um, and you know, hotter and drier conditions due to climate change. You know, it's, it's the two, not just one. Um, on the climate change front, you know, there's been a number of studies looking at trying to quantify the role of climate change. One of the more prominent ones was a, a 2016 study that was also cited heavily in the, the recent U.S. National Climate Assessment, uh, which argued that about 40% of the increase in burn area since the 1980s uh, could be attributable to changing climate conditions. Um, obviously, there's other studies out there as well that argue that, you know, it might be a little bit more uncertain or that some regions are, you know, have a clearer climate signal than others. For example, there's a, a recent study that suggested that there's a much stronger climate signal in the Sierras than in the coastal regions of California, for example, in, in wildfires. Um, so it's a complicated issue, uh, but it is clear that, you know, the solutions are, are really twofold. The first is better forest management and the second is mitigating climate change. Robert, what's your perspective on this? Uh, I agree with uh, you know what Zeke is saying. Uh, 
you know, basically there's two factors to worry about with uh, wildfires is the fuel low load, how much of it's on the ground and the fuel quality, how, you know, dry and flammable it's become. And climate change plays a big role in determining fuel quality as you get hotter temperatures and in some cases drier conditions as well. Uh, this, the hotter temperatures, even for the same amount of precipitation, will suck moisture out of the plants and make them more prone to burn quickly, burn hotter, uh, and make situations worse. But as Zeke says, we have been managing the forests for many, many decades in a way that has allowed fuel to accumulate and you know, creates problems for us. And going forward, the climate change is gonna, that we've already had will continue to be an issue. And if we're going to control forest fires, we have to find very proactive ways of uh, managing the forest conditions. Yeah, w one thing that's important to emphasize is that even if we could magically solve climate change tomorrow, cut all our emissions to zero, global temperatures would stay flat. We wouldn't actually go back to the conditions we had in the 70s or the 1900s. And so no matter what we do, you know, current conditions are going to, at the best, become the new normal. Um, and so that still means we need to take measures outside of mitigating climate change to, to mitigate those. Um, and forest management, and particularly this issue of uh, overenthusiastic fire suppression, has been an issue that, that people have known about for a long time. You know, a decade ago, I worked with some forest service people who memorably told me that they really need to replace Smokey Bear's shovel with a drip torch. And the problem with the forest service is that they need to start more fires, not put out more fires. And so, you know, there is a lot of general acceptance in the space around the need to better manage our forests. The real challenge is getting uh, the financing and manpower to do so. Uh, and that has historically been a challenge, particularly now when so many of the people who would otherwise be doing thinning and controlled burns are having to spend all their time, you know, dealing with catastrophic wildfires. Yeah. Uh, you know, and this fire season, about half of the 3 million acres that burned in California has been territory that hasn't burned at all in the last 20 years. Mm. So it's been land that has accumulated for at least that long. Uh, we have to find ways to you know, manage it and reduce the load through controlled burns or other means on a more regular basis. Robert, you touched on the role of temperature in the fuel source and drying it out. I know uh, from your work with Berkeley Earth and your, you know, every month we release temperature data and I know globally July 2020 was tied uh, with the previous year as the warmest July since record keeping began in 1850. And also in 2020, it's been the warmest April, May and June. So give us a hint at what August is looking like and, and maybe that helps helps under, helps us understand what's going on a little bit. Well, August, like preceding months, is, you know, among the warmest months in, on record. Uh, in particular, in California, where the you know, explosive fires began, it was the warmest August. Uh, and for most of California, it was also the driest August in terms of what we call the vapor pressure deficit, which is a measure of how much uh, moisture is in the air versus how much it can hold. And when you have a very large vapor pressure deficit, it dries out the soil and it dries out the vegetation and creates conditions which are very flammable. Uh, so I think the, the climate conditions and the, you know, the weather really, but the climate change is a part of that weather, uh, has created conditions that were very much primed to burn this season. Zeke, you actually live in the San Francisco Bay Area where Berkeley Earth was founded and where our headquarters is. And so you actually lived through a pretty rare phenomenon where the smoky air turned the skies very orange for a day or so, um, attracting headlines around the world you know, with an apocalyptic look. What, what is it like to be a climate scientist personally living through scenarios that you're researching at the same time? So one of the things about climate change is we often think about it as a, a slow, long-term issue. And in many ways it is. Um, but every now and then you have these events which really bring it home. Uh, and I think living in California this summer with a combination of record-breaking heat, you know, we had 
110 degree temperatures here in the Oakland Hills. It was 121 degrees near LA, 130 degrees in Death Valley. And we're talking unprecedented levels of heat in all of these regions. Um, plus the wildfires and the air quality, you know, it, it really seemed like we were living in the age of climate change. And I think that, you know, in some ways it's important that people see these big events that reflect the change in climate because it, it makes it more immediate to them. It, it becomes not a problem for their children and their grandchildren, it becomes a problem for them today. Um, and so it, it certainly was uh, shocking in many ways. Um, and you know, California itself has warmed quite a bit. Uh, our summer maximum temperatures have warmed by about 1.4 degrees centigrade, so about 2.5 degrees Fahrenheit uh, since pre-industrial times, with almost all that warming happening since the 1970s. Uh, and so we are seeing sizable climate changes here in California. Um, as, a, for an ex as one example, you know, in Berkeley, uh, where our organization is based, uh, we used to only have about five days a year where temperatures were above 85 degrees Fahrenheit. And almost no one has air conditioners in the city. Uh, in the last two decades, we've averaged about 15 days a year uh, where temperatures are above 85 degrees. Um, but some years seeing you know, 30 days or more of temperatures above 85 degrees. And so, you know, we're really seeing fairly dramatic changes to the climate of the region. Uh, a lot of people, including myself, are starting to talk about getting air conditioning units because it's really hard to deal with 110 degree heat without one. Um, and, you know, we, we see uh, the climate changing uh, around us every day here. Not to leave out the rest of the world, uh, Robert is actually based in Switzerland, and I know you had some heat heat wave experience this summer. Are you seeing anything kind of that you could relate to as well, Robert? So, uh, you know, the situation here is by far nowhere near as dramatic as what has happened in California this year. Uh, but we have had, you know, a number of runs of warm days, uh, and I am Right now, I'm very sensitive to the heat in the day because we have, you know, a newborn baby and we don't want things, her to be comfortable. Uh, but, you know, it's also, uh, it was fairly memorable, not immediately this summer, but this last winter because there was such a deficit of snow. There was, you know, usually in this part of the world, there's a lot of snow every winter. Uh, and this season, there was hardly any. Uh, which is, you know, another manifestation of how things are changing. So uh, my last question is just maybe give a, a little bit of an ex explanation of what the public can rely on Berkeley Earth to provide. Like what, what are your, both of you kind of focus on different angles of what your research. So what do you try to provide on Berkeley Earth to help the public learn about global warming and air pollution? Uh, so Berkeley Earth is very much, uh, you know, a data organ data uh, science organization. We gather information about conditions around the world, and we want to communicate that to people in a way which is easy to understand. Uh, so we have a number of products that do that. Uh, one of which, on our website, you can find real time air quality information for many locations around the world. Uh, so you can, in the recent leaks, you've gotten to see how extremely bad air pollution has been in the Pacific Northwest, uh, reaching the worst air quality anywhere in the world for most of that time. Uh, and you could also look up historic norms for you know, places like you know, Portland, where you would expect it to be you know, eight, parts, uh, eight micrograms per cubic meter of air pollution, and you were getting you know, three or 400 which is not, uh, not exciting, but uh, hopefully it cleans up there soon. Uh, we also provide a number of information about climate and historical weather changes, uh, particularly focused on temperature. Uh, so you can understand how has the weather evolved uh, in your city, your country, uh, and really get a feel for, you know, not just, how, not just that the whole globe is warming, but also how your piece of it is warming. Great. Anything to add to that, Seek? Yeah, uh, just to say that, you know, we also publish uh, various analyses in the scientific literature, looking at things like how well climate models have performed historically, uh, looking at, you know, changes in ocean and land temperatures compared across different groups. Um, and, uh, you know, we also put out a lot on, on social media, both on the Berkeley Earth uh, Twitter feed uh, and Facebook, as well as Robert and I are quite active there. Um, so there's lots of places to find 
uh, various analyses that, that we do. Great. Um, do either of you have any advice to members of the public who are concerned, you know, especially again, given all the, the fire and air pollution news this month, any, any last, uh, any advice you can give us? Um, um, that's unfortunately for the foreseeable future, at least this is not going to be, you know, 2020 is, is obviously an extreme case, uh, but these high temperatures and, and large scale fires uh, are going to be something we're going to have to live with for the near future. You know, there's certainly a lot that we can do to try to mitigate them and we need to do much more as a society. Um, but ultimately we're also going to have to adapt. Yeah. On a personal level, you, you know, you need to be prepared if you're in a fire zone to get out or if you're, even if you're not in a fire zone, have plans for high levels of air pollution, you know, filters and window cleanings and things. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a serious issue that will not be going away anytime soon. Uh, you know, and in the long term, I think the best thing people can do is support uh, strategies and, you know, leaders who want to see change. Because we will have to address these issues, both the forest management and also climate change. Great, great. Well, thank you both so much for your time. I hope all of our viewers, listeners can visit berkeleyearth.org and get real time and historic air pollution and global temperature data. And uh, to close, I wanna say to keep our work independent, we do rely on public support. We are a nonprofit. So we hope you'll please uh, donate today. Thank you very much and have a great day.